All righty. Sabbath peace. It's another opportunity for us to come together in here and learn of the word of truth that's given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast and give him freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it, to the saints watched in on the camera, for the saints scattered around the world that we don't know about. But no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. May Allah. You have to sit down. You have to be quiet. Listen to the book, okay? Alrighty. This is uh, uh, Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. So last week, we read about the book of Esther, right? We talked about how, you know what I'm saying, you had uh, you had the king of, uh, king the, the king over, uh, that was the, his palace is in uh, Shushan. You know what I'm saying? You had the king, and he said, uh, he had to dismiss his first wife. You know what I'm saying? So, I ain't gonna call it his first wife, but he had to dismiss his queen, his original queen. And after he dismissed her, he said, I gotta find me something new. He found a beautiful woman named Esther. And Esther had a, a, a cousin. His name was Mordecai. Mordecai pretty much raised her. You know what I'm saying? He'd given her guidance. Ended up being that when a man rose up, his name being Haman, he rose up and he sought to kill all of Mordecai's people. Nobody knew that the queen, Esther, was actually the same people as Mordecai because she hid it from the folks. Right? So after that, uh, Esther, you know what I'm saying? Although the king did agree for all of our people to be killed, right? On one particular day, however many of people they could kill, he said it would be legal for that one day, kind of like the purge, right? Um, although he made that legal, when he found out his wife, his queen, was actually Hebrew, he turned that around for us, right? And we were able to kill the man that put the law in place in the first place. And then we was also able to kill anybody who, who, who was planning to kill us. Um, he made it legal for us to defend ourselves and to take vengeance made it illegal for them to 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 uh to defend themselves back you know so that that put us in a position where you know what i'm saying the most high god turned this thing around based off of that they gave us uh when i say they they talking about talking about mordecai mordecai and esther they ended up giving us purim so they started they started up the day of purim um and that's how we end up celebrating the year the day of purim the month of adar the month of adar being the 12th month of the hebrew year that's where we are. Um, so this week, we're going to pick up because we know in the grand scheme of things, we talked about Ezra, right? And Ezra uh, came back to build the, uh, to kind of set things back in order after the temple was built, right? So in the beginning of Ezra, the foundation was laid to the temple, and then they ended up building the temple. Then Ezra came back as a priest, right? And he started to walk around kind of letting people know, like, yo, we got to keep this law. And he started to get things back together. Remember the men, we found out that some of the men was marrying these strange wives. So he told them, nah, man, let's all make a covenant. Everybody put away their strange wife, right? And that's what they did. They got rid of the kids too. And so now we're about to look at Nehemiah, right? But before we get to Nehemiah, I wanted to read in, in Malachi. So this is Malachi. Malachi is a prophet that would have been prophesying around in this time period. So it's good to see what the Most High God was saying to the people during this time period. This is... a uh, this is uh, Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. The burden of the word of Yahuwah to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? It was not Esau Jacob's brother, says Yahuwah. Right, so listen. The first thing you got, this prophecy is written in an interesting way, right? <clears throat> so the Most High God is talking to us. And while he's talking to us, he's quoting back things that we have said. Right. Thoughts that we have had. So he kind of he's kind of bringing it back to us. So the first thing he say is, I said, I love you. It's God talking. Right. I said, I love y'all. But. Right. And then he replied back to himself, mimicking us. He said, but y'all say, 
when did you love us? Right. So he's kind of he's giving us the conversation. But our side of the conversation, he's telling us our oh, thoughts yeah. and some of the things that people don't vocalize out loud or sometimes people do vocalize out loud. So most high God say he love us. We say, when have you loved us? And then he going to defend himself. Watch this. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith Yahuwah? Yet I loved Jacob. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. <clears throat> Whereas Edom, Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus mm -hmm. saith Yahuwah of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom Yahuwah has indignation forever. Your eyes shall see, and you shall say, Yahuwah will be magnified from the border of Israel. <clears throat> a son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Says Yahuwah of hosts unto you, mm -hmm. unto you, O priests, that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised your name? You offered polluted bread upon my altar, and you say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say the table of Yahuwah is contemptible. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, says Yahuwah of hosts? And now, right, so he's saying you wouldn't, treat, you wouldn't treat no respectable man like that. Right? He's saying, listen, I'm calling out the priest too. Priest like, when we mess up. Oh, you don't remember when y'all were putting on there that polluted bread? In other words, they wasn't keeping the law in the way that we were supposed to prepare the bread and put it on top of the showbread table. Right? We getting into Exodus now. So once we at the beginning of Exodus, but next week we're going to read about how they put together the showbread table. Right? And we had to put a particular bread on that table and we had to keep it on that table and switch it out every Sabbath. The priest did. Right? So we had to look at it. And say, if it's not according to our law, that thing becomes polluted. So he's saying, y'all breaking the rules. Y'all bending, bending the rules a little bit. And as y'all bend the rules, y'all don't have the right information. Y'all not doing it. Y'all not following the right information to, to, to put the showbread out there. That makes it polluted. Right? Then he goes on to say, and not only that. He ain't stopped there. He said, and not only that. Your butt is giving me a whole bunch of, of animals that's sick and blind. He said, if you took a darn sick calf and gave it to the governor, would he accept it? Or would the governor look at him, bring me that sick darn cow? What am I going to do with that? Right? That's not honor. You bring somebody some, some rejected, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the refuse that you have, that's not honor. So the most I got looking at, he's looking like, you know what I'm saying? Nah, y'all don't honor me. Right? Keep going. Watch this. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. Mm-hmm. This has been your means. Will he regard your person, says you of hosts? Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for nothing? Neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, says you of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name in a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, says Yahuwah of hosts. But you have profaned it in that you say the table of Yahuwah is polluted. And the fruit there. Right. So he said you have profaned it in saying that the table of Yahuwah is polluted. This is uh, Malachi chapter 1. What verse? 12. It's Malachi chapter 1 verse 12. Keep going. But you have but you have profaned it in that ye say the table of Yahuwah is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. You also, you said also, behold, what a weariness it is, and you have snuffed at it, says Yahuwah of hosts. You brought that which was torn, and the lame and the sick, thus you brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, says Yahuwah of hosts? Be cursed. Be the deceiver which has in his flock a male of a male and voweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, says Yahuwah of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. 
Keep going. <clears throat> and now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, says you of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you and will cause your blessings, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already because ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I right? Will so, so far, who is he talking to most? Peace. Why would he be talking to the priest this much? The ones responsible for the sacrifices. They're the ones responsible for keeping the people clean. Right? You remember, you remember in Ezra, the beginning of the book of Ezra, who was the majority of people that came to rebuild the temple? It was the priests and the Levites. Right? So at this point, our land is full of priests and Levites. And they're trying to reestablish this thing. They're trying to reestablish our people. So the Most High God is being very hard on. He tells them, listen, y'all can't be cutting corners. I'll let y'all back in the land. This is not time to cut corners. Do it correctly. Follow everything that's written in the commandment. Otherwise, it's polluted and it's profane. Right? Keep going. And ye, <clears throat> behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung among your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts, and one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, says he who of hosts. Mm -hmm. My covenant was with him of life and peace. I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The what is he talking about? Uh, in Sinai, the wilderness. Yeah, grab a hole we got right there. He said, I made a covenant with Levi, right? Because there was a day that man feared me. Right? Uh go uh this is uh this is uh Exodus uh hmm, Exodus chapter 32. Give me Exodus chapter 32, give me verse 5. It's Exodus chapter 32, give me verse 5. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to Yahuwah. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And mm -hmm. Yahuwah said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have mm -hmm. made them a molten calf and have worshipped They made them what? A molten calf and have worshipped it. <laughs> right? They made a molten calf and they sat down and they worshipped it. The Most High God is looking at it like, man, these people are worthless. Go and get down because I'm about to kill these folks. Right? So Moses had to go on down. Watch what happened when Moses went down. And have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And Yahuwah said unto Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and I may consume them will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why is it kept? That's why That's why the Most High God chose Moses. What he just said right there, that's why the Most High God chose Moses. You got to admit, at this point, these people have given Moses nothing but a darn headache. Right? This whole situation was just something thrown on Moses' lap. That he just had to take care of. He had to figure it out. But Moses had such a love for his people. Right? Because he had such a love for his people. He didn't let that get in the way of a clear vision that he had for the people. So when the Most High God said, listen, let me just go ahead. And kill. I'm about, the Most High God didn't ask him. But Most High God is like, listen, just stand aside. I'm going to kill all these boys. Right? I'm going to kill every one of them. And then I'm going to start and make you a great nation. Right? Moses got... Uh, I mean, I think he had two kids, right? Moses got at least two kids. So Moses could have become a great nation. We know we know Abraham did it with less, right? Abraham had one in a pocket. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> right? So Abraham, he made a great nation out of him, 
Moses got two kids. He could have been like, you know what, Most High God, they some sinners. I don't know what's wrong with you. Go ahead and do it. Let's make a great nation out of me. And that would have been all the. It would have been called the nation of Moses, right? Our our nation wouldn't have been called Israel. It just would have been called Moses. That would have been his legacy. But the Most High God chose him because he knew he didn't have that heart. He didn't have a heart to want it all for himself. He looked at it like, mm, I'll tell you what. Let me uh. Let me let me let me help figure this out. You know what I'm saying? Let me just go down there. Let me talk to the people. You know what I'm saying? Let me just see what we're working with. So now he's convincing God, like, no, no, no. Don't break them out. It's gonna make you look bad. Watch what Moses say to God. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn right. So right look, what Moses is trying to say, he's saying, listen, God, if you kill them now, then the Egyptians, the same Egyptians that you showed your power through and that you got your great name through because now they scared of you because everybody looking like, oh, yeah, the God, you who is real. They going to they going to tarnish your name by saying, oh, he only brought them out for mischief. He did all that to bring them out just to kill them in the wilderness. Right? So he's looking like that ain't going to look good for your name. Moses knows this man's heart. I mean, uh, Most High God knows Moses' heart. So in doing that, he, the Most High God said that to him knowing how Moses was going to respond. Right? So that's why Moses, I mean, that's why the Most High God messed with Moses like this. Right? Keep going. Watch this. <clears throat> Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swear by thy own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land have I spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto the people. And Moses turned and went down from the mount. And the two tables of the testimony were in his hand, and the tables were written on both sides. And the one side and on the other were they written. <coughs> and the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither it is the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise, the <coughs> excuse me. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he had came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it with fire and, <coughs> excuse me, and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Mm -hmm. And Moses said unto Aaron, what did this people unto thee that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. <coughs> but they said unto me, make us gods which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. And I, and I said unto them, whosoever has any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it to me and cast it into the fire. And there came out this calf. <laughs> there came out this cow and I put it in that's how it came out all right keep going watch this and when Moses saw the people were naked for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame amongst their enemies mm -hmm. then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said who is on Yahuwah's side let him come unto me right so Moses stood in the middle of the camp and he asked the question he said who is on Yahuwah's side let him come on to me in other words if you on God's side, come here. Right? Whoever on God's side, come over here, is what he said in the middle of the camp. Now, watch who responded. Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus says you who are God of Israel, put every man his sword in his side by his side and go in and out from the gate to the gate throughout the camp. 
from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And their the fellow children of who? Children of Levi. So the children of Levi oh, wow. are the ones, they the ones that stu stood up. Right? Keep going. Watch this. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to Yahuwah, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. The that he might do what? Bestow upon you a blessing this day. So they, because they were committed to the Most High God, even to the point that they would commit judgment against their own people, Right? They, they said, listen, I'm on God's side. Then Moses told them what to do, and they followed through with it. Because of that, the Most High God blessed them. So let's go back to Malachi. When we're looking over in Malachi, that's exactly what Malachi is talking about. Malachi is saying, listen, they, were, they made a covenant with me. Right? What verse will be on? Malachi what? Chapter 2, verse what? About 2, verse 5. This is uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse 5. Watch what the book say. <clears throat> my covenant was with him of license life and peace and i gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name mm -hmm. the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not found in his lips he walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity for the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of yahoo of hosts Mm -hmm. But you are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says Yahuwah of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother? For by profaning the covenant of our fathers. Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, for Judah has profaned the holiness of Yahuwah, which he loved, and has married the daughter of a strange God. Yahuwah will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto Yahuwah of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying, crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore, and receiveth it with good, with, with, with good will at your hand. Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom mm. thou hast dealt. He said, Yahuwah has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. Watch this. Keep going. <clears throat> yet is she thy is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant and did not he make one yet, right he said isn't she your companion and the wife of your covenant and did not he make one right keep going watch what he's saying yet yet had he the residue of the spirit and wherefore, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For Yahuwah, the God of Israel, said that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, says Yahuwah of hosts. Therefore, take heed of your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. All right? So what he's saying here is when you have your wife, and then you go out and you put her away, to try to get another wife or to try to get another, you know what I'm saying, go to try to deal with another woman. He said, you've dealt treacherously, treacherously with her at that point. He said, that's like committing violence and then trying to cover it up with your clothes. Right? Because you get a wife, divorce her, and then go try to get you another wife. Right? But he said, no, nah, you dealt treacherously with the wife, wife of your youth. This is where y'all should get it from when he clarified for us. He said, listen, I know you think you divorcing somebody. I know you think you put her away. But you put her away and go get you another one. That's adultery. Right? That's why, that's why we teach it that way. Right? It's adultery. 
He said he made one, right? That's what the most high God preferred. Godly offspring coming from one husband, one wife, married to each other. Right? Not none of the funny bunny stuff. You know what I'm saying? Not none of this stuff, you know what I'm saying? You got a dude to be like, well, I feel like I was born a woman, so now I'm a trans woman. You know what I'm talking about? Or I feel like I was born a man, so now I'm a trans man. No, nah, that don't count. You know what I'm saying? You exactly how you came out. You know what I'm saying? You feel like you something else. I feel like I was a darn dog. Y'all talk, call me darn crazy. You know what I'm saying? You are what you came out as. You know what I'm saying? I understand how your brain works. Sometimes people are crazy. Sometimes they eat a lot of stuff. And sometimes they take all these shots. The stuff make you a little crazy. That's all right. You got to stick to it. Right? And everybody got to resist their temptation. Ain't nothing, you know what I'm saying? Ain't nothing against the gay person. Listen, you gay, I understand. I understand you got an unnatural affection to, you know what I'm saying? Something you ain't got no, you know what I'm saying? You, you, a, you a boy, you like another boy. You a girl, you like another girl. I understand. I get it. I understand how it works. But the, the, the idea is everybody got to resist their temptation. <coughs> we all got temptation. I'm a boy and I like women. You know what I'm talking about? From the, you know what I'm saying? From the room, from the rooter. I like them things. Guess what? Got to resist that temptation too. I got to get married just like everybody else. The only difference between mine and yours is what you want, you ain't never going to be able to get married to with your gay butt. You know what I'm saying? That ain't how that thing works. Right? You're going to have to, you're going to have to go ahead and either they, the books say it's a blessing too. Books say you can stay by yourself. That's the myth, right? Yeah, everybody ain't got to get married. Ain't no, it's no commandment in the book to say you got to get married. So, you know, you got an unnatural affection. Best thing to do is go ahead and leave it alone. Leave everything alone. They'll be like, no, nah, I don't want to deal with nobody. You know what I'm saying? I just be friends. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to deal with nope. Don't get too close to me. It might tempt me. Get your butt away from me. All right? But that's the, the main point is we got to do everything we can. Most high, look, most high God gave us, gave us an opportunity to have life. Right? We can't sit here and play around with it unless we don't believe. And if we don't believe, why are we playing? Why are we wasting time? If you don't believe this book, do you know how much good, great sin is out there to commit? I just, me, I don't understand. If you don't believe the book, why well, I'm going to sit here and play double dutch with the book? You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I kind of believe it. I kind of, it's some good sin that you could do. Listen, let me, if I truly believe the most high God wasn't real, man, please, I'd probably be a millionaire or in prison. One or two. You know what I'm saying? I'd be, I'd rather be a millionaire or in prison. One or two. You know what I'm saying? It wouldn't be no in between, though. I ain't playing double dutch. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to live it up and pay for it, or I'm going to live it up and somebody getting paid for it. You know what I'm talking about? One way or, one way or the other. But that's crazy to sit here and be like, you know what I'm saying? Well, I kind of believe it. I kind of don't. So I'm going to kind of live this way and kind of not. Are you killing time? You know what I'm saying? You, it's, it's, it's a whole lot of sin potential out there. You know what I'm saying? You know how much potential these sinners be having? These boys out here living it up. You can't think of one righteous black. You know what I'm saying? All these black folks is poor. Except for, except for the top of the sinners. You know what I'm saying? You got the top of the sinners. Them boys is out there. They got money. I don't see how you could be black and a sinner and not have no money. That's crazy. If you're going to be poor, black, and a sinner, you might as well repent. You know what I'm saying? It's like an Everest commercial. <laughs> what you got to lose anyway? You, know what I'm saying? you ain't doing nothing anyway. You know what I'm saying? Like, what else are you going to do? You might as well just turn that thing around. How you going to be poor and your butt is black? You know you ain't going to get nowhere in darn life. Right? And then you sin it, so your only chance to get a meal ticket, you lost at it because you're a sinner and you're still poor. That's crazy. Might well, you know what I'm saying? You might as well turn that thing around and then live forever. That's the only chance we got. That's the lot for our people. That's why the Most High God put us in this position. <coughs> He ain't trying to. He didn't. He didn't put us over in America so that we can all have a bunch of money and not feel our captivity. He put us over here so we can feel our captivity. That's why these people ain't gonna lift. They 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 feed off our neck until it's time for us. You know what I'm saying? Until we repent. Until it's time for us to get up out of here. Right? Our people don't have no money. This stuff is a facade. These people be darn faking every time they turn around. The stuff we call money in our community, man, that stuff don't be nothing compared to white folks. Can't compete with these white folks, and they got they they got us confused. They got our mindset so warped, right, and so so manipulated, 
and they instill so much internal fear that the strong, the pro black man, the one that we look at and be like, dang, he fearless. He be speaking truth to power. He running the darn mouth. Anybody to tell you, you need to invest in the black market. I mean, the black dollar. You know what I'm saying? You need to, you need to take the black dollar. You need to spend it in the black community. As soon as you hear somebody get talking like that, that's saying that's white supremacy. Most people are not going to tell y'all that. Saying take the black dollar and circulate it 17 times in the black community, all that foolish people we talking about, white supremacy is what that is. Right? White supremacy, the very thing that they think they're fighting against is what they're playing into. Because you got to ask yourself, if you see the white person as your enemy, and let's just see that, not everybody do, but let's just say, and I don't mean just white skin, right? I'm talking about the white power structure that is there to keep people down, black people specifically, right? If you see that as your enemy, right? Then you have to ask yourself, <coughs> what makes them most uncomfortable about me? Tell me one time a black per I mean a white person that's racist complained that a white per I mean that uh that a black person didn't want nothing back from what they stole. Just imagine that. Okay. I steal from you, right? I steal, I take it. I run down the street. Right? Do I want you to go find it? If look, if you if the person who got something stolen from looked and said, "You know what? That's all right. I'm going to go make that back. I'm going to go go to work." work real hard and I'm gonna make that same money back. How they gonna the person that stole it, how they gonna feel about him saying that? They be like, yeah, that sounds good to me. I'll come rob you again. You know what I'm saying? When you make it back, I'll be back to you. Tell me when you can pay Friday. Okay. Same time. Same time darn next week. That's gonna make that person feel good. I stole from you. You don't even want nothing back from me. All you want to do is work hard, do it on your own. You don't you don't even want to ask me for help to get some of your money back. I stole your money. I'm building a house. You don't even want to come back and be like, man, just loan me a couple of dollars at least. You don't even want that. All you want to do is build it on your own from scratch. Oh, cool. I'm going to steal it from you again. As soon as you get done building, because now you chump to me. I stole it one from you. Your scary butt ain't say nothing. So I'm going to come back and steal it again. Right? That's how we think, right? Why do you think that's not how they think? How do people rob all your ancestors and you get up here and be like, no, I'm self-made. I don't want to ask the white man for no handout. I don't want to do this. That You sound like an idiot. That's white supremacy talking. You saying the same thing that the, the racist Republicans is saying about you. Pull yourself up by your bootstrap is what they tell you. That's the same as saying I'm self-made. I don't need no handout. I don't need the government help. I'm going to get it on my own. All this stuff, they turn around and they manipulate you into feeling like you strong when you really weak. You ain't got to lie to yourself about your condition. Ain't nothing strong in that. No, we poor. The average of our people poor. There's some exceptions. There's always exceptions. I ain't talking about exceptions. I'm talking about the average of our people. The average of our people are poor and more poor than any other group of people. So now we got to deal with that. We got to say, okay. How are we going to deal? What are we going to do with that information? Right? And the right thing to do with it is, well, listen, y'all owe me something. Right? I need that. I need the reparations. And we're not going to stop. <clears throat> That's what makes these people uncomfortable. When y'all but get to asking for stuff, when y'all but get to talking about what they owe, that's what gives them uncomfortable. You, you go get you go get one of their face and you talk to them about, you know what? I'm a self-made, you know what I'm saying? Self-made, I just want to work hard, get it on my own. I bet you they look at you and be like, yeah, that's about right. That's good. No, that's good. I appreciate that, right? And then you go to them and be like, no, nah, but you know what I'm saying? Y'all people stole some stuff from them. Don't you feel like you owe them? Watch their reaction different. You got to think about if this is your enemy, if this is how you see them, if this is your enemy and you black power like you say you is, you got to think about why your enemy so happy with how you, you know what I'm saying? Why your enemy so, so, appreciative of how you move why they approve of all your move they looking like yeah no nah, i nah, i respect that black man you know what i'm talking about that's your enemy though yeah okay <coughs> ain't your enemy that boy manipulating you 
right? Ain't nothing wrong with asking for reparations. Just like it wasn't nothing wrong with Moses going to Pharaoh saying, you know what? Let my people go. He asked Pharaoh to let him go. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like, Moses. let me tell you what Moses didn't do. Moses didn't say, hey, Hebrews, sneak in this way. If we sneak out the back, Pharaoh won't see us. We got to get it on our own. You know what I'm saying? You never saw Moses do that. You know what Moses did? He said, hey, you mind if we leave? Moses, our God wants us to go make sacrifices. Moses, uh, Pharaoh said, nope. And after that, Moses come back again. And he came back again. And he kept asking till Pharaoh let him go. Now, of course, the Most High God started whooping some butt. But you don't think the Most High God will whoop some butt now if we got our act together? Y'all going to listen. At some point, the people going to see what's in Revelation. And they're going to see all that mess that's happening in Revelations. It's not just happening because the Most High God is judging the world. Right? That's happening because the Most High God is recovering his people. That thing is going to be about us, a lot of it. Right? And it's at some point we got to wake up and kind of look at it and say, oh, well, let me pattern myself after what the books say, as opposed to pattern myself after what these, what these people say. This is uh, Malachi. Where are we at? Malachi chapter what? Two, three? Uh, two, verse 17. This is Malachi chapter two, verse 17. Watch what it says. You have wearied Yahuwah with your words, yet you say, wherein have we wearied him? When you say everyone that do, doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, he delights in them. Or where is the God of judgment? Behold, I will send my messenger. He shall prepare the way before me. Watch what he say now. He Amen. said, behold. What does behold mean? Pay attention. Check it out. Look. When he say behold, that means pay attention. He said, look. I'm going to send my messenger. And what are you going to do? He shall prepare the way before me. <clears throat> uh-huh. And Yahuwah, whom ye shall, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come in his temple. Even the mm -hmm. messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, says Yahuwah of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto Yahuwah an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offspring of Judah and Jeru then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto Yahuwah. As in right, so he's telling you, you yeah. have to understand what he's saying. He, we are in the land right now, right? We got Levites in the land that have been consecrated, that are also making offerings right this moment. And he's saying, hey, it's going to come a time that it's going to be a, a, a messenger and he's going to come and he's going to prepare the way. And then Yahuwah himself is going to be in the temple. And he said he's going to purify the Levites that they could then make offerings. And then your offering will be accepted. These people got to be looking like, I don't know what he's talking about, but maybe he's talking about what already happened. In their mind, they might be thinking that already happened. No, 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 no. He's talking about when we leave all of these countries that we've been scattered to, America, Brazil, Russia, Europe, all the European nations down in Africa, down in Asia, all these different places, all these different continents and countries that we've been scattered to. The Most High God is going to gather us from every corner of the earth and he's going to bring us back. But before he do that, it's going to be a prophet that prepares the way. This is what he's talking about. This same thing happened with Yahushua when he came. A lot of people look at this and be like, that's talking about Yahushua. It is. It is talking about Yahushua. And Yahushua did have uh, Elijah come in the form of uh, uh, John the Baptist and prepare the way. That's absolutely what this is talking about. And at the same time, Yahushua told us, and we're going to read it when we get to the gospel. He told us, Elijah still got to come first. So that lets you know this still has to happen again. Right? He's going to come because we didn't see that Yahushua purified no Levites. That still got to happen. The temple still got to be rebuilt, and the people still got to purify Levites. Most High God still got to purify Levites. Right? This stuff still has to happen. Keep reading. Watch this. 
and I will come near to you to judgment and will be a swift witness against the sorcerers. What that mean when they say a swift witness against what? The sorcerers. And, and who else? Adulterers and against the false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith Yahuwah of hosts. Right? What does it mean to be a swift witness? And as soon as you do it, it's getting punished immediately. Like in the wilderness. Do in the wilderness, you saw people get punished when they got acted, when they acted up, huh? You know why? Because the most high God was speaking to a man that was right in their midst face to face. Listen, when the most high God is right there, like I got Moses, I'm right here, and I'm talking to Moses apparently. Right? I'm talking to Mo like, yo, so look, Mo, no, man, the other day I thought that was good. I listen, the way you handled that, I approve of that. You did good. He's talking to he's just talking to Moses, right? Nobody talked to God like that. If Moses is right in the middle, at any point, Moses can go and be like, look, God, uh, down the way, they got an issue. They say it was a it was a man that was blasphemed. Now I know that's foul, but I don't really know how you want me to handle it. Most I gotta respond to him. Oh no, yeah, blasphemy. You gotta stone him. You gotta you gotta, you gotta put him to death. Okay. That's what we're gonna do there. So like he can go to he didn't need an arm and a thumb him. He didn't need no prophet or anything. He could go and get a clear man. He asked a question and get a clear response from the most high God. Right? Moses was different. And this is your leader, and he's in the midst. So that means that anything you need to know, you got it right there from Moses. So there's no excuse for us to disobey. Right now, it's a little different, right? We don't have a Moses. We don't even have a prophet. We don't have none of this stuff. All we got is this book that was written thousands of years ago. And, it, and it's written and translated and all that. So we got to look at it and try to figure this thing out. Like, okay, what should happen? What are we supposed to do? What does this look like? Right? We got to figure it out. So the Most High God is not a swift witness on us because he's far from us. So out of mercy, he say, if I was a swift witness every time y'all see it, I punish y'all right off, man, that thing would be out of line. Y'all wouldn't have a chance, right? So out of mercy, he's far away from us. So he, he don't show himself to us, but at the same time, he don't punish us right away. Well, guess what? If the most high God is there in the midst and he talking to you and he's showing you miracles and all that, guess what's going to happen on the other end? You're going to get punished more swiftly. So he's telling you that there's going to come a time that a messenger is going to come and this messenger messenger is going to prepare the way for Yahushua and Yahushua is going to come back here and they're going to kill all this stuff. And before that, the priests and the Levites are going to be sanctified again and they're going to start making offerings again. And during this time, the Most High God will be close to us. He will be speaking to us. We'll be seeing miracles. We're going to have plagues breaking out. We're going to know the Most High God is real. Oh, but the sorcerers. See you know what I'm saying? If you bring your darn little pink Himalaya salt stones and you bring your darn uh little, you know what I'm saying, little purple, you know what I'm saying, crystals they be wearing on their darn net, right? You bring your darn horoscope out there, you got your darn iPhone, you pop it out and be like, mm-mm. No, today it say the Sagittarius. Bow! Most I got to gonna pop your butt. Bow! Your butt gonna fall right on out. Bow! Whole iPhone just gonna be floating in the air. You falling. Bow! Hit the ground. Most I got going to light your darn butt up because it's not playtime no more. If you bring that stuff out, it's not playtime no more. When he gets to showing, we don't know what we be asking for is the problem. We all be one like, God, show yourself. The most High God, it's mercy that he don't show himself to us because we some rank sinners. We, I mean, we, goodness gracious, we some rank sinners and hypocrites and Ain't committed to nothing righteous. Everything we start, we put our hand and we give it up. Or we muddy up the waters. We can't commit to nothing. We can't give our heart, our, our whole heart to God in any way. And you think the most high God going to come back and be a swift witness to us and it's going to work out? All of us will be dead. That's his mercy why he don't sow it to us. So now he's trying to give us enough time to get it together, to repent, to learn to love him the way we should. So that way, when he show back up here, we can go into the wilderness, we can go into the land, and we'll be a righteous people. But listen, anybody who ain't right, 
He gonna be a swift witness today, but he said who? The the sorcerer, the adulterer, who else? The sorcerers against the adulterers, against false swearers, against the right, the people that be out there lying, like, nah, I saw him do that. Wow, your lying butt gonna get popped. Bam, I don't know. I like to believe, like, you know what I'm saying? Like the sand gonna come up and just swallow. I've been watching Dune, you know. I like Dune, you know what I'm saying? The sand, you know what I'm saying? Big old sand, just a big old, you know what I'm saying? The sand just looking Dune in the movie Doom. They be walking and them boys hit the ground like that. They be, you know what I'm saying? I like that. Day. You know what I'm saying? Hit the ground and it be a big old worm underneath the sand. And that thing come up and they be hitting that thing. Just, you know what I'm saying? And the, and the people that's not from the desert, they don't even know what they doing. You know what I'm saying? They looking at them like, what in the world are you doing? That dude walking up to him, he hitting him. You know what I'm saying? Next thing you know, that, that worm came up, the ground started, the sand just started getting soft on their butt. That thing, he all started getting in like, what the heck? Then all of a sudden, that thing opened up his mouth. It's like it's a big old worm under me. They swallow their butt right on up. That's what I like to listen. I like to believe we in the wilderness. We think, and as soon as you know, what I'm saying, as soon as somebody just get, they pull out their horoscope. Most of God just gonna sit there. You know what I'm saying? Lighten their butt up, then a worm gonna come up and just swallow their butt. You know what I'm saying? That's just what I like. Keep going. Let me see what else. <coughs> And against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, says Yahuwah of hosts, for I am Yahuwah, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Mm -hmm. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, says Yahuwah of hosts. But ye said, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yeah, you have robbed me, but you say uh -oh. this the one. Anybody who been sister Sharon, where's sister Sharon? Just sister Sharon making it. Oh yeah, sister yeah, Sharon. Making it. Yeah, sister Sharon. This one you probably familiar with this. Dude, I don't know. Sister Sharon might got a good look. If if any pastor only collects one offering on Easter, he might not be too far. You know what I'm saying? Like he celebrating Easter, so it's like he off still. But he only did. He only took a one collection plate. Let me tell you something. He might not be too far. You know, you remember y'all, she was like, you know what I'm saying? You are not far from the truth. You know what I'm saying? He might not be too far. You know what I'm saying? Like, he, you know what I'm saying? He might just got just a little bit to go, but he might be ready. You know what I'm saying? I wouldn't be surprised. He might convert his whole church. You know what I'm saying? Be like, yeah, we are no. Look, imagine the pastor come back in. We are no longer calling ourselves. You know what I'm saying? What they be calling themselves? First and second Ebenezer Church of Christ. We are now going to call ourselves Congregation of Israel. You know what I'm saying? All the members going to look and be like, what is he talking about? You know what I'm saying? Why would we call it Congregation? That's Old Testament. You know what I'm saying? They're going to tell them from now on, we will honor all of the feast days. I don't even know what our feast days. You know what I'm saying? But he might turn that thing around. He's going to lose 90% of his membership. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Probably going to have to shut down the doors, figure out some other way to make it a little... But he might turn that thing around. Right? But this is what the pastor... This is the one the pastors be using. This is the one where they... When they want some money from the congregation, they say, are you robbing God? Watch what you, you will say right here. Will a man rob God? Yeah, you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? <laughs> right? We say, how have we robbed you, God? Watch this. <clears throat> In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Mm -hmm. Bring ye all the tithes unto the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, says Yahuwah of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will Right, so this, <laughs> so this is when he tell you, look, listen, you have to understand the reason why y'all poor. This is how the pastor be talking to y'all. reason why y'all poor? Because y'all have been robbing God. Y'all haven't been giving God his tithes and his offering. All you got to do, look, he said it. It's right there in the book. If you gave him the tithes, and when I say him the tithes, I'm talking about that little collection plate that's going around. It's about to go on your roll right now. Just drop your money in there. If you gave him the tithes, then he would open up the storehouses. Don't you, really, don't you realize he will bless you if you do it? And so then we look at it. And then the next time, 
you see the pastor, he's going to tell you that the law is done away with. They hypocrites. Only place you can learn about a tithe is in the law. Ain't no, there ain't nothing in the New Testament that's going to teach you about a tithe. Only place you can learn what a tithe is is in the law of the Most High God, the law of Moses. So it's done away with how you turn around and collect the tithe. How you don't have, look, you won't teach the people to keep a feast day, but you will collect the tithe. All that's in the Old Testament. The part you think is done away with. So it's hypocritical. It's like, it's, it's cool when it's for money. All right, and it's cool to make your people feel guilty, but I want y'all to know you ain't got to feel guilty. You, you, when you take your butt to church, and you know what I'm saying, I know some of y'all, you know what I'm saying, but when you go, when you take your butt to church, it's all right, you know what I'm saying. If he get to hitting you with this verse, you ain't got to feel guilty about that. Ain't no tithe, ain't no tithe until you got a Levite, all right? And if you ain't got a Levite, you ain't got no tithe. You give an offering. Now it is an offering, right? You give an offering to any man that deserve it, right? Any man or God that deserve it. These boys don't be teaching no book to you, so you ain't even got to feel guilty about that. Right? A man laboring the book, he opened up the book, that makes sense. Look, a man just sitting there and he reads you two, three verses and go on for an hour and a half, 45 minutes, kind of freestyling about what them verses meant. You can read one verse, and the Lord said, take my hand. Let me tell you something. Yah is, I mean, not Yah, they don't say God. God is reaching out to you right now. Often to take your hand, but keep pulling your hand back. Right? You know, and they like to do theatrics and stuff. They'll be like, uh, Brother Deacon, uh, come over here and stand behind me. You know what I'm saying? And then the pastor go like this, and they're going to do the trust fall. They fall backwards, and the deacon catch them and be like, and that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to trust him. And all that stuff get us hyped and going. But then we forget the fact that, like, oh, he only read half of a verse that says, reach out and touch my hand. You know what I mean? You can't, you know what I'm saying? That's not laboring in the word when you do that. That's creating your own word. It's about your own glory when people get to doing that stuff. And at some point, we as a people, we got to want more for ourselves. We got to not just want more for ourselves. We got to want more for our people. We have to get to a point where we shun that behavior in our culture. Right? Because what happens is it confuses us. Right? Because we're in a position where that has always seemed right to us. <clears throat> we used to think that people jumping up, running around in the church is catching the Holy Ghost. We used to think that's a sign of the Most High God. That confuses people. So now they grow up and the real word touch them and they don't know how to feel. They feel conflicted. They think God being mean. People listen to me teach them, teach them about God. They be looking like, man, the way y'all teach about God, you make it, make it look like God is just gloom and doom. The true loving God in their mind is gloom and doom only because they've been lied to about who the true God is. That's not fair. That's not right. Right? So we got to make sure we straighten this stuff up. We got to, you know what I'm saying? We got to, you know, set these people straight. And when I say set them straight, that don't mean you, you know what I'm saying? You stand out, on, stand out in front of the churches and you're trying to convince them of anything. But part of it is just making sure we uphold the standard. Right. We uphold the truth. We uphold the standard by doing that. Then the people see what what the right thing is. Man, all these people just looking for something that's right. That's all they're looking for. They can run their mouth. You can look. You might die before they admit it. But these people just are looking for something that that's that's trustable, that's sustainable. Right. And if you show it to them, you might die again. You got to keep this thing to your death. But I'm telling you, after you die, when you righteous and the people see it, they're going to look at it and be like, surely that was a woman of God. Surely that was a man of God. Surely that was my sister. Surely that was, that, that was my brother. You know what I'm saying? And they're going to feel bad, but it's that sorrow for some of them that's going to lead them into repentance, going to lead them into righteousness. This thing is a long game for us. Like it ain't, it's not, it's not just, you know what I'm saying? It's just, you just got to be consistent. That's all you got to do is be consistent. You just got to be there. I tell everybody, it's like being a, a, a lighthouse. You know what I'm saying? Because that water, when you're on a boat, that water get crazy. Sometimes, I mean, the wind be blowing, it raining, waves hitting. Your boat might turn around. But if it's a lighthouse right there, the lighthouse is just, it's, it's, it's in the ground, way underwater. So that lighthouse is there. It's not moving anywhere. So as much as your boat turn around, every time it hit a full circle, you see that lighthouse. So guess what? No matter how dark it is, no matter how much the wind is blowing, you know 
that, okay, I got to go that way. And you spin the rounds and you going like, mm, I got to go that way, right? Here. Oh, well, now it's over here. Oh, well, now it's over there. But you got to turn your boat and you got to make sure you row or do whatever, sit the sail, do whatever you got to do to get to that lighthouse. We got to be lighthouses for everybody because this world is going to spin people around. It's going to lie to them. It's going to make them think right is that way, right is that way, right is that way. Then it's going to make them think it ain't no right. And when people think it ain't no right, this is what they're doing. They dizzy. They're just going around in circles. When they think there's nothing right, when they think that all is the same, when they think that there ain't no God, when they think that none of this stuff matters, this is when they're spinning around in circles. And the only thing that can help them is every time I do a full circle, I see this one light. Some of them are going to stop spinning and go see what that light is about. And that's you if you stay consistent. If you stay and you obedient, that's you. And it ain't no bigger glory. If we want glory, it ain't no bigger glory than bringing somebody to the Messiah. Right? It ain't no bigger glory than that. Just one. If I get, look, if I get one under my belt before I die, I do all this talking, do all this teaching, do all this stuff. If I get just one under my belt before I die, man, I'll be happy. Because I know how difficult it is. I know I'm not, I'm not confused. Listen, I don't look out here and be thinking all these people are righteous. I don't care how, I don't care how much church you go to. I don't care how much good you do, how much charity you do. I don't look at the, all these people and assume, oh yeah, everybody righteous. That's not my assumption. My assumption is a lot of these people is hypocritin. I'm going to mind my darn business and I'm going to be consistent. Keep going. Watch this. <clears throat> and I will rebuke, rebuke the devourer, devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time of the field, says you of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, says you of hosts. Your words have been stout against me, says you Yet you mm -hmm. say... What have we spoken so much against you? Ye have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before Yahuwah of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, and they that tempt God even are delivered. Then they feared, then they that feared Yahuwah spake often one to another. And Yahuwah hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him. For them he said, what now? A book of what? A book of remembrance was written before him. Watch this. Go back. <clears throat> Read that again. Then they that feared Yahuwah spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. In a book of right? remembrance. They that did what? Feared Yahuwah. Did what? Spake one to another. It's important to understand that I know we be feeling like, we be feeling like, oh man, this stuff go without notice. But listen to what he's saying. He's saying, listen, y'all have spoken foul about me. Read it again, because I want y'all to understand it. Let's go back up. What verse What verse it start at? <coughs> 13. It's verse 13. Watch what the book say. Your words have been stout against me, says Yahuwah. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? You have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? And that right? Walk, walk. These are the people that give up. These are the ones that are saying, listen, man, this stuff is pointless. I was righteous for two whole weeks and ain't nothing changed in my life. I spent the whole weekend and I didn't sin. And guess what? I haven't seen one chance. You've been sinning your entire life, hypocrite in your entire life. And you give God a weekend and give up. Give him two weeks and give up. Right? You give him three months and say, I only lie once though and give up. Most of our guys looking at that like, man, you sound crazy. But our mindset is telling us, man, it's vain, it's empty, it's worthless to keep uh, to keep the uh, the commandments of Yah. Ain't no point to it. <coughs> Same thing gonna happen, right? Whether I'm righteous, whether I'm unrighteous. Same thing gonna happen, just like Job was saying, right? Same thing gonna happen whether I'm righteous, whether I'm unrighteous. Most of our guys say, man, no, that's foul. What you talking? What you saying about me is wrong. Keep going. Watch this. And 
And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God even are delivered. Right? And so then we end up looking and giving honor to wicked people. We sit here and we say, oh, well, goodness, man, the proud people, the people that boast themselves against God, are oh, they happy. They set up. Them boys, ballers, they got money. We sitting there honoring these folks. Watch this. Keep going. Then they that feared Yahuwah spake often one to another. He and said, but those that feared Yah, they spoke a lot. They talked often. I don't know, maybe like twice a week. Right? Like maybe every Sabbath, they made sure that they got together and they talked. They spoke often because they feared Yahuwah. And let's see what happened as a result of that. <clears throat> and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared Yahuwah and that thought upon his name. Listen. They shall be mine, says Yahuwah of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spared his own son that serves him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and to him that serves him not. All we got to do is be patient and consistent. Right. Be patient and consistent. A lot of times it's it's like we going to feel like nothing is happening. We going to feel like nothing is shaking. We going to feel like it's, it's pointless. It's nothing. If you take that thought that that's a temptation, that thought, if you take that thought and let that become action and you stop upholding righteousness and you start sinning right then at that point you've given up but those of us who stay consistent right <coughs> those of us that if we mess up we repent and we say okay you know what for real i'm gonna do it this time right those of us that stay consistent the most high god is gonna remember this there is a book of remembrance and he is paying attention to this stuff we don't see it we don't know what is it but at some point, the Most High God is going to show up here. And when he do, he's going to remember everything. We just got to be consistent. You give up, he ain't going to remember none of the foolishness. Keep going. <clears throat> For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, day, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. For the day that comes, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, says Yahuwah of hosts that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise and healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, says you of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgment. He said, remember you. The law of Moses, my servant. God commanded him in Horeb. Pay attention to what he's saying. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahuwah. And he shall before the coming of that day, I will send you Elijah the prophet. So y'all remember we read about Elijah, right? Elijah we read about in the book of Kings. Elijah was that great prophet. He resurrected a man. He had Elisha under him. He did all types of miracles, just like Yahushua. He was doing all types of miracles. And then eventually, the Most High God took him up in a, in a whirlwind of fire. And Elisha saw him take go up. And he was looking like, goodness gracious. Right? <sighs> but that's Elijah. He never died. The book don't, say, don't have any account of him dying. It just showed him being taken up. And the Most High God is saying, before that great and dreadful day, Elijah is going to come. But before he told us Elijah was going to come, he told us, remember the law of Moses. That he gave to us in Horeb. He's telling you that he is going to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. And in a day. You're going to remember the law of Moses. And I'm going to send a prophet. And when I send that prophet, it's going to be in the spirit of Elijah. And watch what Elijah is going to do for us. <clears throat> Keep going. 
And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. That's I have no idea what that means. I am going to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers. For what reason? Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. He going to do that unless he come and smite the earth with a curse. So now, when you turn the heart of the children to the fathers, who are the fathers? The ancestors. Israel. The ancestors, right? The way we use the word fathers, it talks about the ancestors. He's not talking about, oh, well, you know, you know what I'm saying? If some people think, oh, well, you know, black men don't take care of their kids. So what he's saying is, you know what I'm saying? He, no, 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 no. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. And it's a myth. You know what I'm saying? But that's not what he's saying. You know what I'm saying? What he's really telling you is we have ancestors that we've been disconnected from. Don't know, none of us know where we come from. Right? Don't know. We sit here thinking, like, oh, yeah, I did my 23 and me, and they say I'm 63% Nigerian. Oh, shut your darn. Right? It's saying 63% of the people that share your DNA is in Nigeria. That's not saying that your lineage is Nigerian. It just means that a lot of people, a lot of people that look like you, a lot of people that are from the same place as you happen to be in Nigeria. And it just so happens that's exactly where the Israelites went. All of West Africa. And it just so happens that the Moors pointed out the Israelite and the Spanish and the, and the, uh, and the uh, Portuguese. Portuguese. They pointed out the Israelites right in West Africa. And it just so happens after Columbus found the new world and they saw all that good land and they said, man, we can, we can make a lot of money if we had, you know what I'm saying, some good cheap labor to work on this stuff. They said, aha, I have an idea. Let's go get the Israelites. Don't nobody like them anyway. With the, uh, with the approval of the Pope. With the approval of the, under express approval of the Pope. That's what the Inquisition was about. They want y'all to believe the Inquisition was a war between the Moors and the... No, 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 no. <laughs> the Inquisition was about getting our people. And look, it's just like the, uh, it's just like the economy here, right? So the economy in America <coughs> after Wait, slavery... Work till you die. The economy in America changed after slavery. So it was a big resistance in the South because so much of their economy down South was supported by slavery and not just down south really all of america right but so much of the economy down south was supported by slavery so when slavery was so-called abol abolished they had to resist it and they had to come up with other things so you know what they did they said well technically i can't enslave you but since you ain't got no money i can do something called sharecropping so technically we share the profits of this crop you work it and I fund it. So then in sharecropping, I can say it costs me all this money to fund it. Now you have to work it to pay me back. Because I'm also like paying for you to live here. I'm paying for you. I'm paying for all these different things. So what you working in the share crop, it has to come back to me anyway because I'm paying for everything. And so then they cheated us. And they really wasn't giving us no money. So then when that wouldn't work no more, they had to come up with something else. They say, listen, well, we still need the state, still need some labor. <coughs> Through the state, they start imprisoning black people. And they say, okay, well, it's legal to enslave you now as a prisoner, as a criminal. So then we get convicted of crimes at a higher rate because it's profitable to the state to have us work in these fields and to have us make license plates and to have us do all these things later on in time. And that continues. So they continue to set us up even on to Joe Biden and, and the, a lot of the Democrats passing the crime bill. In the same way, they make money off of these things. Right? So, not much has changed. Our, our people have always been in a very tough position. So, even when it was time to find cheap labor, labor to work the new world, right? The Americas, right? They went and they said, hmm, I know just the people. 
and they picked out the Israelites. They gaffled it up, put up on shift, came over, and we worked the land. Right? That's how all this stuff plays out. But we're not Nigerian. We just don't have the connection to our ancestors. What Elijah is going to do is he's going to tell each person, you are a child of one of the fathers. You are a son of Issachar. You are a son of Judah. You are a son of Naphtali. Oh, but you are a son of Asher. You are a son of Dan. You are a son of Reuben. You are a son of Ephraim. You, Manasseh. And just go through. Ah, you three. You all are all Levites. But you, you're a son of Aaron. Right? He going to be able to break down our lineages and connect us back to our tribes. So that's why you see in Revelations where it says it start counting off the people. Uh, grab a uh, what is it? Is it Revelations 14? No, it's not 14. Revelations. What is it? Revelation. Uh, I don't know. You ain't got to get it. I can't remember. It's a. Uh, not seven. Not ten. Probably fifteen, I think. Fifteen? It can't be that deep, is it? It gotta be earlier, right? See what see what eight says. Seven. It's seven? It is seven? Uh yeah, seven. Give me give me Revelation <laughs> chapter seven, verse one. What I want, verse one? Mm, you want Yeah. We'll do two, verse two. Oh, yeah, verse one. Yeah. All right, it's Revelation chapter seven, oh. verse one. Watch the book say. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, hold, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice, to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, <clears throat> nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Tribe of Reuben, 12,000. How'd they know they was Judah? It ain't nobody living today. That can confidently tie themselves back to the Israelites. Not one per D Jewish people in there. You ain't you ain't gonna hear none of them get to running their mouth talking about, hey, I'm uh I'm from this tribe or that tribe. It's not that's not true. It's a couple of them that's trying to call themselves Levites. It's a couple of them. There's a couple of them they're trying to they trying to build a third temple, what they call a third temple. So you know what I'm saying? Know, they they call themselves Levites. You know they don't know because every time well, they one, because they ain't the darn people. You know what yeah, I'm saying? But they, what, what would you say? You know they don't know because every time they refer back to like the Bible or like they always be like uh, Moses the Jew or, you know, like such as such Aaron the Jew or something like that. And it's like that term Jew wasn't even a thing like in the Old Testament. You know what I'm saying? So whatever, like, oh, when they talk about the Old Testament, like Moses and all of that stuff with the Egypt, with, with us leaving Egypt, they call them all Jews. But, yeah, they they yeah they don't know nothing about our yeah they have no idea how Moses how Moses gonna be a Jew right you know see so from it the tribe of Levi like yeah be like honestly Jew, you gotta be there. you gotta be of the kingdom of Judah or you gotta be of the tribe of Judah Moses right. is neither right so that's how you know they know. right but these people run their darn mouth no they don't know what they're talking about but nobody today can connect themselves confidently to any of the fathers right so how in the world is Revelation telling us this many from this tribe and this many from this tribe because Elijah is going to reconnect the people. He's going to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children back to the, the fathers. He's going to come back and tell us, you are from this tribe. You are from that tribe. You are from that tribe. You are from that tribe to where we can reconnect our lineage. We can reconnect to our history. It is going to be a beautiful time, but it's not going to come without any cost. There's going to be a lot of people dropping dead. Most High God going to be a swift witness at these times also. Right? The only thing we can do is prepare ourselves and hope that it happens in a lifetime that we alive, which I personally believe. Right? I personally believe 
That thing gonna happen while we are alive. Right? A lot of these people get, you know what I'm saying? A lot of people get all freaked out over these wars because you know, Iran just Iran, Iran, Iran just dropped, it dropped a bomb over on Israel. So Israel, right? Talking about the white folks, Israel. The white folks, Israel, they bombed, you know what I'm saying, somewhere in Damascus, I think. That's north of, of Israel, right? <clears throat> yeah. And after they bombed yeah. them, they actually killed a bunch of leaders from Iran. Iran was like, oh no. So then they launched a whole bunch of bombs uh, and missiles at Israel. Now they all all this stuff is fake because they be warning them like, hey, we're gonna launch an attack. This that. so it's all just for show. It ain't real. So nobody really getting hurt, right? In Israel. But then Israel was like, all right, well, we don't play them games. So they sent a whole bunch of bombs back into Iran and apparently shot up some stuff. I don't know how many people got hurt or whatever, but they, you know, they busted up some stuff. So these are the games that they playing. A lot of people freaking out over all this stuff because they looking at it like uh this is about to be World War Three. And it could be. And when people say World War III, they associate World War III with the end of the world. Although nothing in the Bible say anything about the world ending because of a war war. Right? But that's just yeah, how people yeah. have been conditioned because in, 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 the, in the Second World War, a nuclear bomb was used. And the thought would be, well, now everybody got nuclear bombs. So if everybody started launching off these nuclear bombs, the whole world going to end. That's like the, 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 the thought process. But that's not how it's going to happen. All right. The end of the world is not going to come through a nuclear war. It's not going to come through a whole bunch of people fighting each other. The end of the world is going to come through us being let go. That's what's coming. Right. That's the part that's coming. You got all these things shaking up and we're going to see it. You're going to you got to sit back. The people that have been disenfranchised in this country. Right. And all over the world, in fact. Right are going to sit back and look in all of their countries and they're going to see. They're going to sit back and they're going to look at the people of Haiti, going to look at the people in the DR and looking like, how in the world did that? This is not, this is not. And all these people going to Haiti and take advantage, they're going to start revolting like they're doing right now. Right? And then you're going to look down in Brazil. And the people in Brazil, when the floods hit Brazil and the floods hit Colombia, and only the black neighborhoods get tore up by these floods because they ain't got their infrastructure right. And all these people die and they don't make no news channel. You got this one news article that I got to translate to read it. Right. When all that stuff and it's happening often. But eventually, like the most I got is going to hear that cry. Most I got is going to hear it. People going to start hearing this stuff. People going to start seeing it. Most I got is going to send Elijah here. And when he send Elijah, all this thing going to turn around. And that's going to lead to the end of the world. Keep going. Watch this. <clears throat> of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. The tribe of Nap. Oh, no. Go back to uh, Malachi. Uh, we finished Malachi. Okay. So we, uh, we going we gonna to look at Nehemiah next week. We don't have enough time to start it today. But we're going to look at uh, Nehemiah, uh, ne Nehemiah. Nehemiah next week. And uh, we'll start to dig into how so, so the difference between Ezra was was building the foundation of the temple, right? Mm -hmm. When Nehemiah come, he's going to be working on protecting us. So he's going to work on the wall, right? He wants to rebuild our wall to make sure that all the people are protected. So we're going to read about how Nehemiah, how he got that idea, uh, how he started out. And probably we'll try to get through like half of Nehemiah and kind of see how far we can get. Any questions? Let's see what's in this chat. So, uh, Sister Pam had a question about the. You still got a. She got a question about the multiple wives because God said the wife of your youth in Malachi do not deal treacherously and how they are one. She said, "What, what was the question? Uh, let me go. Like, is it okay to have multiple wives or?" Then, then that. Let's see. Can we discuss the men with multiple wives versus the one he made? Versus the what? The one he made. I'm guessing he's she's saying the uh, the wife of his youth. Yeah, like uh, I, I think she's saying can we discuss like the men that had multiple wives and the men that I mean I guess the one that God made one like you know what I mean like God made him one in the beginning, but then versus what's that versus the multiple wives? 
<laughs> Got it. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a it's a it's a difficult subject. What it what the book suggests, right? When we look at it, the book is suggesting that what the Most High God intends and what the Most High God set out first is one husband, one wife. However, it's nuanced because at no point does the book say it is against our law or against the gospel for a man to have more than one wife. Right. But if the book is very clear, the way he set it up is for one wife. So a lot of times, a lot of times what we focus on in the Bible is just the black and white stuff where the most high God say, that's a sin. You can't do that. But there are certain things in the book where the most high, it's a preference thing. Like the most high God say, you could do either one, but this is better. Right. So an example of that is being married and not being married. Right. You could be married. It's not a sin to not be married. It's not a sin to be married, right? But in the New Testament, we are told that it is better to not be married. Yahushua says some people make themselves a unit. And he says the people who make themselves a unit, that there is a blessing for them. Making yourself a unit is saying that you don't have no sexual relations with nobody. So essentially, that's where Paul is able to draw from and he's able to say, it's better to not be married, right? Because you can focus 100% of your time on God. You don't have to care about none of the world. You don't have to have no worries in the world, right? However, he's not at the same time saying it's a sin to get married, right? Either one is okay. So you have to kind of look at having multiple wives in the same way. There is no law, right? There is no law that I've seen and nothing directly in the gospel at all that I've seen to say you cannot have most a man cannot have multiple wives, right? I wouldn't advise it. I don't think it's a good idea because clearly the most high God gave us the good way, the better way, right? However, it is very clear in the book that the better way is one wife. How can we prove that? We know that to be a leader, to be someone who, who leads a congregation, to be someone who is a bishop or overseer of a congregation, we know for sure that you have to be a husband of one wife, right? So the most high God is saying, the person that, I'm lead, that I have as an example that leads my people must have one wife, right? That's, that is a, that's a order for us, right? We also know that in Genesis, the two became one flesh. Yahushua confirmed that. The two became one flesh. So that's our first example that we have. Our first example, we have two becoming one flesh. And we also know based off of what we just read in Malachi, Malachi told us um, that the two were one, the same thing, right? The two were one and that the most high God wants a godly offspring from it. So I can't, I won't, I won't go as far as to say that having multiple wives is a sin. It's something that I personally ain't got no interest in. It's something that I would always encourage my brothers not to do because I think it's all flesh. I think what you get to doing is all flesh is you trying to, you know what I'm saying? Trying to fulfill your flesh. And I think, you know what I'm saying, most high God is going to use that against people. He's going to have Satan come get you, come tempt you, and you're going to fall over. You know what I'm saying? It's, we just in a wicked time. I just don't think it's a good idea. You know what I'm saying? But I won't speak against it as a sin until I got some book against it, and I don't. I don't got book. I didn't have, I didn't have many arguments with these brothers. It's like, yeah, well, yeah, you know what I'm saying? I really can't lay it forth in the book. I would have to make some stretches or make some assumptions. That's not what I do about the book. I don't make no assumptions. I go based off of what's written. It ain't one verse, not one. It's laws that govern multiple wives. There's examples of men of God that have multiple wives. All that is there. You know what I'm saying? So we got to deal with that. We got to accept that. That's what it is. But it is very. It is also very clear that in the book, the better way, right? The, the way that, that seems to have much more of a blessing and the examples that the Most High God wants to set is a man that is the husband of one wife. Well, yes, it's a family. You could say that you could say that, but by the witness of two, both matters are established, right? We got way more than two witnesses of multiple wives. Right? We got way more than two witnesses of one wife. So, so I think I think we 
we culturally ha- want to make this a right or wrong issue. But I don't, it's not, that's not scripture. It's not, all, all we got to do, we don't even have to take it too deep, right? All we got to do is find the scripture to say, it's a sin to have two wives. <coughs> we find that, then it's, it's not even discussion. Right? It's not even discussion. It, it becomes a sin right there. Okay, book, book say, two wives sin, out of there. Right? But if we can't find that, then it's not, it, from there, it's just assumption for us. We making guesses. It, it, it pretty much would be exactly what we saying. It's like, uh, it feel like he mentioned it, so it feel like that's what he want. And I agree. He, he do want one husband, one wife, but that's not the same as saying that not having that is a sin. Like, again, he also, he also said that that he wants godly offspring, but he didn't say that not being married is a sin either. Right? He also said that a eunuch is going to be blessed. He didn't say getting married is a sin either. Right? So it's, it's still multiple ways to go about things in some cases. And it don't make one wrong versus the other. The only thing that defines unrighteous for us, the only thing that defines wrong, wrong for us, is when there is a law against it or when the Messiah speaks <coughs> against it. And the Messiah didn't speak against multiple wives. He just confirmed the two shall be one flesh. That's not the same as saying multiple wives. Because again, if we say the two shall become one flesh is enough to say it's a sin to have multiple wives, then we have to say also the two shall be one flesh is enough to say not being married is a sin also. Because if, 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 if that's a requirement, two shall become one flesh, that means everybody has to be married. Right? So when we apply the book, everything has to be fair. You know what I'm saying? We can't just apply it just based off our emotions or based off of, based off of what, we, what, we, what, you know what, I'm saying, what we were raised in. It got to be applied based off of what's written. We don't want to go beyond the book. If the book didn't say it. Ain't no reason for us to say it. You know what I'm saying? It's okay. To not look, that's why I say it very clearly. I'm not for the multiple wives thing. Let's be clear. That thing, it's un- me personally. I was just me personally talking. It feels very uncomfortable to me. Don't seem like a good idea. Don't seem like it seems to me. I am speaking personally right now. To me, it seems like a sin. But when it goes based off of what's written, I don't lean on what it seems to me. Right. That's not how I operate. I don't go based off of what something seems. I only go based off of what's written. Now, the most High God come to us and be like, listen, no, I was a sin. Y'all was wrong about that. I'm going to go to him. Per- I'm going to look perfectly confident. That's not what was written in the book. I just went off what was given to me. You know what I'm saying? If the Egyptians tried to take something out of our book at some point, most High God, you got to reveal that to me. Right. But based off of what's written, I can't condemn it. Most high God can condemn whatever he want. Me personally, I can't condemn. He haven't given it to me to condemn. Any other questions? All right. All right, well, let's pray out. (coughs) You all right?